that expression. I was in the shower and I came up with this great idea. It's a cliche. When was the last time you heard someone say, all right, I'm sitting at my cube and I'm updating Facebook and I'm sending a tweet and doing voicemail and checking email and bam, I'm hit with a lightning bolt of inspiration. It doesn't happen. We know that environment matters. That's why we come to cool, amazing venues like this. Because we get out of the grind and we can let our imagination soar. You know, artists, musicians, playwrights for centuries have gone to cool places to spark their creativity. So if we know that environment matters, why does most of corporate America look like this? It's like a sensory deprivation chamber. <laughs> I mean, you've got no windows, bad lighting, no color, no stimulus, and then we wonder why our team comes up with ho-hum ideas. One of the things that I would encourage you to watch out for is groupthink. Groupthink is that poisonous, fear-based attitude that ends up watering, our, watering down our most potent ideas. I'll give you an example. Uh, so Cherry Garcia ice cream is my absolute favorite. It is just the bomb. So it's chunks of chocolate, chunks of cherries, and this cherry-flavored ice cream. Just delicious. It's a multi-hundred million dollar product for the Ben & Jerry's company. But this product would have never gotten through the brainstorming session in most companies. Here's how that brainstorming session would go in most companies. Someone says, oh, I got an idea. Cherry Garcia ice cream, it's going to be great. But then you got Sue over in legal. And Sue says something like this. Yeah. Good idea and all, but you know that one out of 100,000 people are allergic to cherries. Why do you pull those cherries out? Then you got Jim over in purchasing. And Jim says, you know those chocolate chunks? Those are going to decrease my margin by 0.2 cents per unit. Why don't you pull out those chocolate chunks? Then you got Ben over in manufacturing. And Ben says, you know, to get the cherry syrup just right into that ice cream, I got to put a piece of new equipment on the line. I got to retrain my people. It's kind of a pain in the neck for me. I'm trying to get, you know, get out of here early to watch my kid play hockey and all. So can't you just pull that cherry flavored ice cream? What do you got left? Vanilla. Vanilla. You got a big bowl of vanilla nothing, a commodity. And the world does not need a commodity. It doesn't need a commodity ice cream. It doesn't need a commodity TV commercial. It doesn't need a commodity brand. Again, the world craves originality. And if you stop following and start really thinking about how you can dare to be different, I believe you'll be able to achieve the results you're looking for. So I'm building this Lego Death Star with my son Noah, who's 14. And it took us a couple hours, and we built this crazy thing, and, and I, was, I, was, I was proud of it, but I realized something was wrong. Something was wrong. So I actually brought it with me to show you. This is the instruction manual for this Lego project. I wish I was kidding, but I'm not. 192 detailed steps on exactly what to do and where to put every specialized piece. Is that crazy or what? What are we teaching our kids? When I was a kid, this is what Legos looked like. The act of Legoing is you'd take these modular blocks and you'd use your imagination. And you'd build something, you'd bust it apart, and you'd build something new. So again, our schools, our systems, our toys, everything is pushing us in the wrong direction. Simplest thing you can do, it's very, very easy to do it, is ask these three simple questions again and again and again. Why, what if, and why not? Why, what if, and why not? Because when you ask those questions, you force yourself to explore what's possible instead of just what is. You force yourself to challenge conventional wisdom and explore the unknown. Give you an example. A talented entrepreneur was launching a company and she was going to manufacture girls' socks. So the normal business school 101 playbook would be you'd fly overseas, you'd source these socks super cheap, these boring white utilitarian socks. 
You then fly to Bentonville, Arkansas and beg Walmart, please carry my socks. I'll sell them to you for 10 pair for a dollar. But this woman did something different. She started saying, why? What if? Why not? Why are socks boring? What if socks were fun and colorful? Why do socks match? Why do socks come in pairs of two? You always lose one, that's annoying. So here's what she did. She launched a cool company called Little Mismatched. Now you'll notice that Little Mismatched are not boring white utilitarian socks, they're funky and colorful. You can't buy a pair of socks that match because they're color coordinated, but none of them are matching. In fact, you can't even buy a pair at all because they come in sets of three or five. <laughs> so you say to yourself, okay, is it frivolous? Is that really what we need? I live in a, I, I'm in a price competitive industry. There's no more price competitive commodity industry than socks. This company went from zero to $30 million in revenue in four years. It's because she was different and remarkable and creative. And she did something that people would pay attention to because the world craves originality. No one wants another Me Too player. No one wants another Me Too anything. What the world will pay handsomely for is original thinking and creativity. Big idea number one, never cave to your detractors. At the age of 20, I had the idea for my first company. At the time, computers were starting to come in high demand, but you couldn't just run over to Best Buy and grab one or order one from Dell online. Discount computers were actually hard to come by. So my idea was that I could mail order individual components, assemble them in my college apartment, undercut the competition, and still manage to make a profit. Now, I'd never started a company before. I'd never even taken a business class. So to figure out what to do, because I had all this passion and very little experience, I went to my mentor. This was a man that I admired greatly, who had run his own business for 25 years. I reached out, shared my vision, and humbly asked for a $1,000 loan to start my new company. He thoughtfully responded, why don't you send me a business plan? A what? So, it turned out to be pretty good advice, actually. I went to the library. Anyone remember libraries, by the way? <laughs> libraries? So I went to the library to figure out what he was talking about. Once I figured out what a business plan was, I committed. I said, I'm going to write the granddaddy of all business plans. My finished product was nearly 100 pages, charts and graphs and detailed financial projections. I went over to Kinko's, printed it on fancy paper, put it in a beautiful binder, and mailed it off to my mentor, waiting for his feedback. I was filled with anticipation. I was bubbling. I couldn't wait to hear what he would say. I was waiting for praise and congratulations. But what I heard was something very different, something very disturbing. That's a stupid idea. It'll never work. What the hell do you know about running a business? I'll never loan you money. That would be irresponsible. You will fail. Now those words stung, but the pain was far greater because that man was my father. The man I'd looked up to my whole life had doomed my plan to failure and told me that I should accept defeat. Well, something inside said I should forge ahead. So I scraped up some money by playing jazz gigs, I maxed out my credit card, I launched my business, and I never looked back. I made countless mistakes along the way. But I somehow had the fortitude to see it through to success. Two years later, I ended up selling the company for a healthy profit just before completing my undergrad. Whatever your dream is, there will be no shortage of people telling you that it can't be done. The detractors will show up in droves, and they're there to test your resolve. It's up to you to, to just simply ignore the noise. 
In my case, I followed my heart, even when my own father told me I would fail. But as a result, I'm here today. You must never cave to your detractors. You must never relinquish the power of your own journey to the fear or insecurity of another's. Those scientific laws that we spoke of earlier, they will inevitably try to derail you and you'll hit some speed bumps along your journey. But with passion and commitment, you will overcome. You have the gift of creation and the opportunity to make a real difference. Put passion first. Pursue the unconventional alternative. Aim at the window of the future. Let go in order to seize greatness. And whatever you do, never, ever let anyone get in the way of reaching your full potential. Thank you. I think the story of Detroit, so far anyway, has had three chapters. It started out, chapter one, with amazing creativity and entrepreneurship. People like Henry Ford came in and did different things. They broke the mold. We were imaginative and entrepreneurial and took risks and had original thought. And as a result, we prospered. It put us on the map. We built this amazing city and gorgeous architecture, and that's the reason we're all here in this room. Then chapter two, the unfortunate chapter, the dark ages, comes along, and what do we do? We get away from those roots. We start thinking about entitlement and bureaucracy and systems and controls. Instead of building great things, we manage cost and we cut control over our people. And what happened? We suffered. And we suffered big. So today, where are we? Today, we're at the beginning of chapter three. Each of us has the choice. Choice number one, we can point fingers, we can complain about it, we can long for a good old days gone by. The second choice, and the one that I hope you take, is one of grabbing onto it and saying, we have an unbelievable opportunity. We have a big blank canvas with the city of Detroit. What a privilege in one's lifetime to have the opportunity to rebuild a great American city. So instead of looking at all the negatives, let's, grab, yeah, let's acknowledge them for sure. But let's latch onto that opportunity to do something special. And I really believe this is it. This is your moment. This is my moment. This is our moment. This is our moment to make a difference. This is our moment to unleash the creativity that's already inside all of us. This is our moment to take the challenges head on in the city and this region and rebuild it and make it a place that we're proud of and that we can hand down to our children in a better way. This is our moment to get creative and this is our moment to change the world.